All right, I just want to see a show of hands this afternoon. How many of you have ever re-gifted ever? Shame on you. Shame on you. Yeah, I've done it too. All right. How many Seinfeld fans in the room, right? Yeah, that was uh, nine seasons, 180 episodes. It was originally advertised as a show about nothing. And if you ever watch it, you would go, yeah, this is like a show about absolutely nothing. And it, it is a uh, focus is on the mi- minutia of everyday life, that our lives are really made up of these small little moments. And what I uh, think about right now in, in this series that we're in, I want us to remember this too. Our faith is uh, made up of these very small moments. A lot of us have some aspirations about different things like around our faith and that it's uh, combined maybe in these big moments and we understand all these things. But, you know, I really want to say with all my heart, I mean, a lot of times our faith is comprised of just these very, very small moments coming together to make a whole life, right? And that's what we're doing. We're talking about this right now. We're in this series. We're calling the series Love the 561. Say it with me. Love the 561. And uh, here's what we're doing. We're connecting two very, very important uh, ideas. One idea is this, personal devotion. So part of our faith Part of what it means to be a follower of Jesus is to have, to build into our lives uh, what I would refer to as a personal devotion. And uh, in fact, when I was writing many years ago what became the core values of our church, I I said this, uh, that that personal devotion uh, to Christ is normal for every believer. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. So personal devotion. But then there's this other thing on the other side, and it's called practical application. So if we're going to do personal devotion right, it is going to show up in what I would refer to as a practical application of that. Our faith is never solitary. Our faith is never private. It will lead us to public moments. That's really true and really important. And if you go back a few centuries, we've been saying this. There was another theme many, many years ago that uh, that the religious writers and the historians of that day, a couple centuries back, when they would talk about this concept that we're referring to right now, they would refer to it as this. They would call it vital piety. I had a woman after the last service come up to me and say, I'm reading a book right now, interestingly, on vital piety. I thought that was really fascinating. And uh, vital piety was just the way a couple centuries ago people were talking about personal devotion. But vital piety, they said, would always have uh, an influence in and draw us toward what they refer to as social holiness, that there was an outward expression of our devotion. And if you look at the Bible, this is what I want us to understand. It's everywhere in the Bible. In fact, I was reading this past week in the book of Galatians, and uh, Paul is writing to the churches in Galatia, and notice what he says here in the back end of this verse. You get to see both of these things. He says, the only thing that counts is faith. There it is, personal devotion. Faith counts. It matters. But watch what he says. But faith expressing itself through what? Through love. Through love. It's not just enough to know things. We want to step into our faith being something that shows up in love. Right? And then uh, it's interesting, if you look over at, at, at James, who's that brother Jesus, in his way and in his day, notice what he said. He said, religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. First of all, this, this, this uh, predisposition, here's what he's saying. He said, there is a religion. There's a religion that God honors. And so there's the personal devotion part. But then he says this, here's how it shows up, though. It's to look after orphans. It's to look after and show up for widows in their distress. It's to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. There it is. Personal devotion, practical application. We go all the way back to what Jesus said. And Jesus made an observation about this in Luke chapter 10, right? He says this, we should love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our strength, and with all of our mind. There's personal devotion. But we should also love our neighbor as ourself there's the practical application. So what I'm really wanting to say in this series in so many ways is that we would not divorce one from the other. We would not place an overemphasis, say, on personal devotion or vital piety to the, to the uh, expense of practical application or social holiness. So we're connecting those two. They must always be together everywhere in amen. Say amen to that. 
All right, so I was thinking about this, and we're looking at this right now in a very unique way. We are talking through the, the five love languages, and we're, and we're asking ourselves this uh, question about our hometown. We're saying this, could it be possible that a church and the people that attend this church could be used of God in such a way that things like homicide or divorce or substance abuse or suicide or children in foster care and all these other things that plague our society might actually be impacted by a church. And here's what we're saying. Yes, they can. Yes, they can. And so we're talking about that right now in our series. And so what we've been doing is pushing into these different values. We talked about this first value of a word of affirmation. And we're, we're saying that, you know, all around us are people that just need to be encouraged, need to be strengthened, need to be lifted up. And we should try and strive to do a better job at this as something I'm working on right now in my own life as I'm going through some things in my own life. And I'm thinking, okay, I need to do a better job you know, at this. I, I was thinking about this in a, in a unique way. A couple weeks ago, uh, whoever does the rotation for preaching or worship, if they're out west, they typically do it all four services. And so it's a lot. It's a, it's a lot of work. And so uh, I was thinking about this, and, and I was on the preaching rotation west. I preach all four services, and afterwards we were going we to unload the, the pumpkins, which is a tradition uh, in our church. So uh, right after church, uh, after three services on Sunday, I changed clothes and went out and helped unload some of the pumpkins. And uh, my little routine, I know there's probably more information than you want to know. I don't eat anything on Sunday morning but a banana until after church. And by the time I had uh, gone through the services and unloaded the pumpkins, it was about 2.30 or 3 o'clock. And we have a word in our house, Beth said, I was getting hangry. Anybody know what hangry means? Like, man, it was time for lunch, right? Like, P. Diddy wants some food, all right? And so, like, here's the thing. So we got through with all this, and I told Beth, I said, I, we got to go for lunch. Like, I am, like, right now, we have to go for lunch. And so we went over, and we had lunch together. It's like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, a little bit later than that. And we had lunch, and I told Beth, I said, I want to go home and crash. That's all I want to do is go home and crash. And so she got in the car and she went one way. I got on my truck to go the other way. And as I'm pulling out of the parking lot, this girl backs into me in the parking lot. And I was like, I wanted to crash at home, not in the parking lot. <laughs> and so the minute this happened, this young woman, a young college student, she gets out of the car and she is freaking out. And she is going, I'm driving my mom's car. My mom is going to kill me. It's like the end of all time. And I told her, don't be fearful. You have run into P. Diddy. It's all okay. And so I got out, and she's like having this fit, and I walk around to the side of my truck, and I see what she did to my truck, and I went, oh my gosh, my wife is going to kill me. <laughs> and so you know what it's like when that happens? Like we spent the afternoon together, right? And you just get to know people. And so then, you know, her mom calls me. I'm calling her mom. I'm telling her mom, she's really a good kid. It's all going to be okay. And then I took the car to get fixed. And when I took the car, the truck to get fixed, the person who was fixing it, it was their first week at the job. I was, it's all okay. <laughs> Relax. And she did a fantastic job. She was a little nervous. And I took her, her name and I said, do you have a card? I want to, I want to tell your boss how good you did. And she goes, I don't even have cards yet, but here's my name. And so I just wrote the boss and said, this girl just did a fantastic job. And, you know, here's the thing. We need to be encouraged. Who needs yes. encouragement yes. sometimes? Yes. And then we talked last week about uh, quality time. And, and we said, you know, there are times in our lives, and th this is what we need to do. We need to slow down enough so that God, by the power of the Spirit, may say something to us that he wants us to do in our community. Mm -hmm. That sometimes we miss it because we don't ever slow down. I was reading uh, this week from Christian uh, mystic and theologian Richard Foster, and, and this is what he says. He says, superficiality is the curse of our age. And he said, if superficiality is the curse, hurry is the spell that casts it. And I was thinking about this. I remember last week I shared a, a story about Abraham Lincoln. And uh, Abraham Lincoln, uh, 16th president of the United States, and how he wrote on the back of an envelope the Gettysburg Address. Historians have just marveled at the depth of this, of these 200, and, I think it's 272 words that he offered 
in the depth of that. And one historian says the reason he could uh, capitalize with such depth of understanding about this moment began to turn our nation in a different place. Here's what one historian observed. He said, because when Lincoln was growing up, he had so little to read. All he had to read in his house was the Bible and Aesop's fables. How many of y'all remember Aesop's fables? And they said that by the time he became a young man, he had memorized all of the fables and large portions of the Bible. And here's something about our 16th president. He would say of himself, he would say this, he would say um, that he thinks incredibly slow. And, and, and people, would, you would watch this when all we were going through, if you read historically about the, uh, about the Civil War, you would see his responses to the Civil War, and he would always take a long time to kind of process through that. And one historian and one scholar observed that this is probably true because he had this mental grid of Aesop's fables in the Bible, and he would put everything through that grid, and he had this depth, and he would say these things and these remarkable things. Our nation's still living on those words. I thought about that because uh, Christian mystic Richard Foster goes on. Listen to what he says. It's challenging to me. He said, today, we have traded wisdom for information. And we have exchanged depth for breadth. And so we try in vain in our culture to microwave our own maturity. Man, I don't know about you, but I'm moved by that. So words of affirmation, quality time. And today I want to talk for just a moment or two about gifts. And I believe with all of my heart that our faith, if it is worth any faith at all, there will be those moments in our lives when, when we are required and our faith requires us, watch this, to give back. Paul was writing uh, in the book of Romans, which is his treatise on the Christian experience. So again, I say this often, Paul almost wrote half the New Testament. Everything that he said outside of the book of Romans can find its way uniquely into the book of Romans. Romans is kind of his treatise on the Christian experience. And he makes this little observation. I want you to notice what he says about God. He said, for the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. The wages of sin, what, sins earn, what sin earns us is death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And what Paul is trying to communicate is this idea. He's trying to explain the Christian experience to, to people who are just sort of new to it. And here's, here's what he was saying. The way that we have positioned our lives before God, before a holy God, and, and, and with our sin and our shame and our brokenness, all that has earned us is eternal damnation. Now, like it or not, I'm just a messenger. That's what Paul's saying. That's what it earns us. But in the midst of all of that horrible story, Paul is wanting us to know that we have a God who steps in the middle of all that, pulls the curtain back to expose it for what it is, and says, instead of death... I will offer eternal life. And I got to tell you, that's why we sing. This is amazing grace. Right? That he would take my place. He would bear my shame. And if we're going to understand that right, we're gonna, that's going to move us. I always feel like when, when we understand that correctly, I mean, there's... There's just something about that. That's personal devotion. But, but if we do it right, it will always bring us to moments that require something of us. Large and small, huge moments, little things that no one will ever know, it requires us. I was thinking about that, you know, just even in light of like some of the stories that are unfolding right, right around us in this wonderful church. One story we saw earlier, we, we showcased for you the, the Bruguette family. But there are people uh, in our church who are doing the very same thing the Bruguettes are doing. There are people in this room that are my friends that are doing the very same thing that this family's doing. And they're given the gift of family. 
That's what they're doing. This is pure religion. That we would look after orphans, that we would look after widows in their distress. And we try to keep ourselves stain free from the pollution of the world. Powerful, powerful story. Let's give to family. And this, this, this is why we're saying, you know, I, I love this. This is taking wings in our church. And, and many of you know I've been saying this. So the, the number of churches in our area, about 1,700. The number of kids currently in foster care, about 1,700. And so here's what we're trying to say. What we're trying to raise is like if every church in our area just had one person who stepped forward and said, I'm going to take a kid out of foster care, we would just eradicate foster care system in Palm Beach County. And we're just crazy enough to believe it could happen. So when you leave here today, go check the table out. Go, go learn how you can help and be a part of it. I'm humbled with the people in our church. This is just rising in our church. It's a gift of family. Uh, also, though, I, I've been noticing this week um, and last week what, what I call the gift of help. I want to show you a picture. That's Glen Haven Church uh, that is in the Panhandle in Panama City. And I'm familiar with uh, this, not so much the church, but with the pastor. He went to seminary where I went to seminary. And uh, Omar Vega, who was at our service last night, is, uh, was on special deployment with our state. He's, the, he's part of a, an elite team that gets commissioned to go when this sort of natural disaster happens. He's been up there. He got home last night or night before, surprised his family. And all week long, I was texting Omar, and I was saying, Omar, Omar, if you could, could you get to the Glen Haven area? I want to see. And the minute I asked him that, he texted me right back, and he said, oh, Pastor Dale. He said, Glen Haven area is destroyed. And I said, but man, if you could just, like, if you can get special permission to go, I'd, I'd just like to see it. And so he texted me that picture. And he said, I found it. And I don't know about you, but I, I look at the church, and this is what I think. What do the houses look like? Right? And so we're taking up this offering. Many of us are responding. We're going to be sending teams up there. The money that we're collecting, we'll use every penny of that money for these efforts. And here's what I want to tell you. If you could show that, uh, that picture one more time, Lynn, that's where we're going to dig in right there. We're going to go help this church and we're going to help these people because you know why? We understand, right? A couple of weeks ago, I want to tell you about another story that happened in our church right over here in this corner. I prayed with some folks that were about to undergo a big experience. I want to show you this picture. So this is uh, my friend Ron Burr and this is my friend Carissa Gonzalez. And uh, they, they have grown up together, been friends a long time. Ron's been in our church a long time, and Ron's been struggling. And he's been struggling with a condition that's known as focal segmental glomerular sclerosis. It's a kind of kidney failure. And so he and his friend Carissa just sort of grew up together, and um, Carissa began to feel a very strong leaning that she'd like to help her friend. And as you might imagine, fearful about it and all of that, but she said, the least I could do as a friend, I could, I could see if I'm a match. And guess what? She's a match. In fact, I think they're streaming the service right now. Could we just wave to them right now? And uh, there, I know Carissa today is back down at Jackson, and uh, we're praying for her. She's had a little complication, but we're praying all good things over her and over Ron. And so this is her giving a kidney to her friend. This is life. And I want to say one other thing before we close, and it really has to do with the issue of what I would call faith, giving away of our faith. Many of you know in this series, one of the things I'm trying to highlight is we live in a county that is one of the most unchurched counties in our nation. In fact, uh, it has the largest representation of the, of the fastest growing religious quote unquote segment in our society called the nuns. And I thought I would give some context to that. And so the nuns, here's who the nuns are. They're unaffiliated, non-affiliated, disconnected people. People who say this, we don't know who, what we are, religiously speaking, but we know what we're not. 23% of our population, 35% of millennials, primarily male, primarily educated, stepping back from their faith. And here's the interesting thing. Not so much because atheism is appealing, 
but because religion is so unappealing. And this ought to concern us. And I, I think in God's wisdom that he would put a church like ours in this place with all these things going on and just a reminder that there will be these moments when our faith will require us to give back. And the, and the challenging thing for me when I think about these precious people uh, referred to as the nuns or all these people that are stepping back from their faith, it, what's, what's, what's sad and discouraging for me is a lot of times where we have to lay at the feet the blame of this kind of thing really is people who do what I do and people who gather like we gather. Many years ago in our church, I began to challenge this and I had some people that weren't, weren't happy with me because I challenged this, and they said, it almost sounds like you're trash-talking Christianity. And I said, no, I'm not cra- I would never do that. But I will trash-talk a version of Christianity that makes the real thing any less appealing than it actually really is. Because here's what I believe in my heart. If everybody really knew Jesus and who he is and what he offers and how he loves and how he cares, everybody on the globe would be a follower of Christ. Yes. But so many of us today, we call ourselves Christian, a word Jesus never used one time. And when Jesus talked about his followers, he called them disciples. And a disciple is a follower of Jesus. And sometimes I really think with all my heart, we, we just have to have a conversation and a better conversation about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Because we live in an era right now, we live in a day, we live in a culture when, when our faith, as in every season, should require something of us. Maybe it's a gift of a family. Maybe it's a gift of help. Maybe it's a gift of life. <laughs> Maybe it's a gift of faith. One of my favorite verses is a verse that comes from the pen of Peter. I I like Peter the best because I identify with him. He was hot and cold all the time. He'd like say stuff and then he'd go, can I maybe say that again? You ever do that? That was Peter. But in the book that bears his name near his death, he he wrote this. He said, but in your hearts, learn to revere Christ as Lord. And always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. This is kind of my life first. Do I have hope? Do I give it? Am I prepared to share it? But then he says this. He says, but learn how to do that with gentleness and respect. Because I love everybody on the planet just like I love you. Never, ever forget that. So here's the question. Here's the challenge. What is your faith requiring of you? Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that this is your challenge to your people. And we would ask that you would forgive us, Lord, where we have ever forgotten that, where it has become privatistic, where it has become something that's, hey, Lord, just between you and me, we'll never tell anybody. But Lord, you're wanting something different than that. We have to have personal devotion, yes, but it must have practical application. It must be vital piety and social holiness. It shows up. And God, when you tap us on the shoulder and say it's time to give back, might you find among us, among me, among those who are listening, that we would say yes, and we would give what has been freely given to us. This we pray in the strong and mighty name of Jesus, and everybody said amen. So let me see a show of hands again. Have you ever regifted? Here's what I want you to know. Regifting is a biblical idea. Go and give back.
as you have been given. God bless you. See you next weekend.